And so anyways, that's why this is something you never can repeat to anyone again. So just keep it between us. Okay, so unfortunately, this is the second time this has happened to me this semester. I forgot my notes. Oh, man. Therefore, I had to disengage the photos that I have for you. They'll be back later. Don't worry. No fears. No fretting. But I had to send them to myself via PDF technology, via the email, <laughs> via the old email to yourself trick. That's clever. But mine is my beautiful purple penmanship on the side, like purple people eaters, mm -hmm. helping me, guiding me along. So we have to do it more off the cuff than I like, but such is life, I guess. Right, Sophia? Okay. Um, today we're discussing October, today's October 7th, and it's today's date. Well, today is the feast day of who? What's the day's a big feast day? Oh, Our Lady of the Rosary. Our Lady of the Rosary, Our Lady of Victory, Battle of Lepanto, 1571. Very cool. Very good. Um, yeah, Steve Schmidt. Do you know if your Zoom link still works? It should. I just I logged in because when I can't get into it. The last two, when I put in, when I click the Zoom link, um, I get a please enter your meeting passcode. All that you know, like it's not the regular. Yeah. Sorry. So that's why you're not getting as many as you're used to getting. Well, Perhaps. again, let me just say for people that came last night to talk like that, I'm, I love every aspect of my job, but the hippo lectures are obviously so personal to my heart. And people come out for that. I live one practice. It was cool. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. 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 Sophia was there. That's yeah. really awesome. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> Betsy, Betsy, were there. Betsy, we missed you. Betsy yeah. wasn't, which was also. Awesome. husband was one. Yeah, yeah, but Betsy not being there is positive. I'm saying, like, <laughs> <laughs> no horrible questions, no hard questions. No way, Betsy. I, I long for the day when your schedule is clear. It's three to ten. Next tip of lecture, Claire, were you there last night? I had class at six. Ooh. It was like I'm, I'm non negotiable. <laughs> I was there, but didn't everything, really listen. Claire, everything in life is a choice. You made your choice last Okay, time. this is the first one I've missed since I've been in Moscow. Right. Really? Yeah. Got it. <laughs> That's really I'm not I impressed. think I missed most of them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> My next simple <laughs> like Claire, you are, yeah, Claire, you had like 65 gold stars. You were always there. You're a faithful yes, attendee of the Apple Lectures. Hmm. Um, I'm such a scumbag. I'm the worst person of all time. Like I wouldn't attend my events since I'm so excited. Like I'm so yeah, for real. Like I'm such a tool. Like, oh, come to my thing. Like, do I come to stuff? Like I, I try to, the stuff that I'm involved in. So like, <laughs> like things are, yeah, things that yeah. And things are like I'm like the center of attention, but otherwise, you know, like I think next time you should start with sort of an AA kind of high and brush and can you do that for me? Uh, I, 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 I have those. more matching socks and four years. Hey, and, uh, still not. Yeah, the one they're both they're both out inside out. Can you want to be part of my next simple talk? Seriously, here's the thing. Here's my next simple talk in November, right? Because again, I don't even know. But I think it's the last one. I don't think we're doing one in December. I think it's just November's the last one, and I'll reconvene in January. Uh, we have three Wednesday night events in a row. Next Wednesday is uh, Spirit and Life, like the big thing, right? The parish, really fun. The awesome dinner and you know, Father Chase, the star of the of that, right? Talking about the theological implications of baptism and confirmation. That's the subject. Two weeks from now, like you said last night, we're having the AMA. It's gonna be really fun. Right? There's gonna be a ballot box where we can ask questions. Um, but the next hippo lecture in November, I'm doing on Catholicism and conspiracy theories. How should Catholics navigate mm -hmm. the world of conspiracy? Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Would you come up? Would you come up and do a bit for? <laughs> it is gonna be fascinating. <laughs> good, good burn, good burn. Good point. <laughs> I'm a little bit destroyed, but uh, like half destroyed. Yeah. But here's the thing: would you come up and seriously? This would be awesome. Would you be like, look, um, I, you have a very high Q rating in the in the St. Augustine Church. This is a real thing. You know what a Q rating is? Q rating is an indication of fame. I don't know how. Like a person with a high Q rating is are very very famous. Like Janet Jackson, uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> Jen, Joe Biden, much more than Jan Jackson, obviously the president, like, you know, famous people, celebrities, Justin Bieber, high Q ratings. In St. Augustine, most people know it's shit, I think, they have a very high Q rating, but I don't know, some of the new people, maybe not. It'd be hilarious for you to be like, what I want to do is I'll write the bit, and you can sign off on it if you want to do it, that you're at Roswell in 1947, <laughs> or you grew up in Roswell. You were born, you were born in the Mexican desert, and you're just going to give half a minute how it's all true. And like, it's more true than you can believe. And, and then 
You can tell like an abduction story, whatever, <laughs> if you want. But I want to, yeah, right. Okay, again, it's up to you. But like you're like a real life man in black kind of kind of story. Like they, you're really angry at Tommy Lee Jones because they ripped off your story. They took my story. Yeah. Right. Oh, and then they did the thing where they like erased my memory. Okay, I remember yeah, like that I kind of thing. Remember. That was kind of you have this kind of meltdown. You remember and, the second one where he's working in the post office? That's me. Well, yeah. So and That's you, me. right. And so what you can do is you can like go crazy in the podium, like flip out and like knock the podium over and have to escort you out. Like you <laughs> have that kind of thing. Then I'd miss your box, so forget. Well, see, well, see, can can I, I, um, kind of like, your head. see <laughs> the book that we were supposed to read for today, wasn't that today? Um, I barely started it, but it's really good, and I recommend reading what it. What storm steel? Well, was the earthquake one? Oh. I thought it was. I don't know. Um, just a second. Maybe I'm wrong on the date of it on the syllabus. The First World War by John Keegan. Oh, good. Wasn't that today okay. that it was supposed to be read for? I'm just really impressed with it. Yeah, no, the, the, the like I said again, and for anyone listening online later on when you see it, I've tried to set the bar of this class at like a 300 level, like triple out of 100. The books are 100% optional. So if you're reading along, it's really good. They're there to supplement and help your information, but really the, the meat is just the kind of the lectures and the class that you guys have all faithfully attended, which is again so awesome. Well, I recommend actually reading this one. Good, okay. But not the other ones. Not, not necessarily all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I, I know, you know, most people appreciate Chesterton. I'm not as huge a Chesterton fan as maybe I ought to be. You know, I kind of... You're also not as smart as you could be. Him, I get it. But when I start reading him, I usually don't finish. Fair enough. Fully mm -hmm. fair enough. Also not finish. That's actually refreshing. Betsy, I have the highest respect for your intellect and in everything you do. And it's refreshing to see someone like you not like fawn over Chesterton. I personally love him. I'm a huge Chesterton fan. That's nice. It's good. Yeah, we should be like, ooh, this person's in like, the, they're amazing. They, you've never seen anything bad about Scott Hahn. I talk about Scott Hahn too often. You know? I have like a weird thing. Like, well, what's, what's my problem? Of your talk I know. What's my problem? Why am I playing Scott Hahn? You're envious. That's what it is. Yeah, I'm envious. Him. I probably am envious. Yeah, I'm seriously. He's so, he's so great. Everyone loves him. Why does no one love me? Like that kind of crap. You're right. Yeah, probably. How much time do we have? Yeah, right? Well, well, I wanted to point out that at the beginning of his book, he starts out with a map. <laughs> <laughs> Mental note taken. Hey, um, regarding the book, Betsy, on yeah. another sort of related topic, um, the movie, All Quiet in the Western Front, we went looking for that and we discovered it's all widely available, the newer one. But the old black and white one, mm. which is really the best. And like 1930. You just can't find it anywhere. I could. I mean, you know, I'm sure you could buy it or whatever. Go no. look on BitChute, see if you find it there. Where? BitChute. What's that? B I T, like shoots and ladders. Wait, Bit so you said you couldn't Bit find shoot. it anywhere? I couldn't it's, find the original. It's uncensored YouTube. Yeah, maybe it's They there. remade it um, like in the 70s, I don't know. And uh, yeah, it just doesn't have the same power. Anyway, so look for the old one. Fair enough. Oh, how sad. Well, I you. brought my cord and left it in the car. Ooh. My phone is trying to go. Oh, I have five times. <laughs> <laughs> I have my whole life. Seriously. We'll get to you. You provide me with everything I need. So, today, the Western Front, Verdun, and the song. And I have to say, truly, at this point in the class, we've reached the apex or the nadir. This is the high point or the low point of the war, truly. I mean that sincerely and no jokes aside. There's nothing any, I'm glad we, we're always so jovial and fraternal together and, and joking with one another, but there's no, there's no jokes today. It's just a lot of sadness and awful things. Um, and I say this because we're both at the kind of chronological center of the war. We're done, as you see, is from February 21st to December 18th. It's one of the longest battles in human history. Might be the longest actually, 302 days long. So it lasts almost all of 1916 from start to finish. Uh, 1916, right? The war begins in 14, and then we talked about all of 15, and then America's going to come to war in 17. Armistice Day is November 11th to 18. So even that, in that five-year period, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, Verdun and the Somme are smacked down in the middle. Verdun and the Somme are very related as well. As we go through certain phases of the Battle of Verdun, troops will be siphoned off to reinforce the Somme. The Somme is June 1st, 
um, July 1st, excuse me, 1916 until November 18th. Okay, so both of these battles comprise chronologically the center of the war, the high point of our timeline, but you can also say low point because we'll come to casualties again. Maybe let's start with them. In these two battles, the Sun and the Verdun, there's a, the, the Verdun and the Somme, there is a combined 2.25 million casualties in just two battles, 2.25 million. Just staying with Verdun, which we're gonna start with, 1.25 million casualties. What is this, the, the population of the state of Idaho? I was always taught like 1.5 million. I think it's raised for the most recent census, probably 1.7 maybe, right? I didn't think I'd do that. No. Anyway. I heard 1.5, but I heard it's close to two. Okay, but, but still below two. So in these two battles, in these two battles, in the span of months, not even a whole year, but in the span of 10 months, the entire state of Idaho was wiped out. I mean, these are the kind of casualties we're talking about, right? Um, Maria was here. I'm going to talk about Wyoming now. So I will always associate Wyoming with Maria. I think her state is the least populous in the Union. It's less than 500,000 people. Just the Battle of Verdun, you have casualties that are almost two and a half times the entire population of Wyoming. This is insane, right? Maybe you like New York City as a comparison. 2.25 people, the 9 million live in, in New York City is basically a quarter of New York. And these are just one, these are singular battles. There are two battles, right? In this entire war that we know, remember from the first lecture, costs 41 million lives in some phase. And I do include, God bless these people who you know, lost two arms or blinded. Or, yes, their life was, that cost them their life as they knew it, as they knew it, right? They had to learn to live in a new way. Or these poor men with these massive psychological breakdowns long before PTSD was diagnosed as a condition. They're just, oh, they're, oh, they're just cowards, they're shell shocked, but get back out there. All these horrible, horrible, horrible things. This is that Did high point slash that, low point. That most soldiers who had head injuries bad enough to blind them died. So that's why there aren't more who were blinded because they were dead. Sure, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's so sad and awful. Yeah, that's why, again, we talked about we talked about Adolf Hitler earlier in the class, um, and one thing that really embitters him going into the interwar period, one of the biggest things is that he is one of these victims who's almost blinded by gas, and he's as he's convalescing in a hospital, and all the kind of extra horrible stuff that goes into his writing Mein Kampf for the next decade. Um, but he's also one of these victims. He's he, he's he like countless other men um, is exposed to literally hell on earth via gas, via the trenches, all these kind of things. Yeah, we cannot, if I had really had to stand before people and make a defense, like a one-time thing, like a 30-second appearance on some news network about what is the most important thing about World War I, I think it's that psychological impact about questioning what it really means to be human that in some ways creates all the depression and the kind of, I always explain when I talk about America, we're not going to do this in this class, but when I talk about, I've taught in the past like modern U.S. history, which is basically from Reconstruction 1877 to today, to the present day. And when I talk about the Roaring Twenties in America, I always say this, that they were, they were like a big party in two ways. They were the reason people party to this day. There was a celebratory aspect to it. We won, America won. We came in and you're gonna see in this class later, that's true, you know, I've said that many times, but the Americans are the prime reason. They are primarily, primarily responsible for coming in and saving the day. But you also party sometimes to forget, right? I want to get so drunk, I don't remember my own name kind of thing. That's what World War I, I think is the ultimate impact the world over. Mm -hmm. We want to get so drunk on a new way of living. You see this in architecture, the rise of the Bauhaus school, forget everything in the past because we want to hopefully try to have like purposeful amnesia considering, considering what happened in this war. It was so awful, it was so terrible. Let's try to do whatever it takes, artificial, natural, whatever, psychological, to unremember, to disremember, right? I'm trying to think of a word stronger than just forget. It's not enough to forget, like just to completely like de detox from what this was. I think you could see that in the 50s too, kind of a bit. Sure, sure. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Maybe we need the baby boom generation in Levittown and the idea of everyone having the same, that classic American cliche of the white picket fence, lemonade stand, 2.5 kids. It's so annoying, you know? Can't have 2.5 kids. Can't have half a kid. Wait, in the 50s, people had more than 2.5 kids. They had 3.2. Well, whatever. The 50s had... was sort of the, the, the baby boom when people were having more kids. I'm going to talk about this in our conspiracy before lecture. I'm not going to tell you what. I want to, I want to kind of really 
really convince you when you sit there and be like, I'm going to be driving kids around and I won't go. And then I will never know. That's what I'm saying. I want you to be like, I need to find people to help me with the kids. I need to to find out what he says. What is conspiratorial about the baby thing? I need to know. I want want you thinking that you're going to come. Maybe the children do have that sense. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see, how many children do you have? I have four. Four. Let me give a number down. I have an name for Just hey, you have 14, you said? Point four. Four. Oh, is point. it? Point four. You have point four. Oh, okay. 14.4. 14. 14.4. 14. Got it. Wow. That's really congratulations, that's guys. <laughs> would you say the point four? How does the point four compare to the other 14? You would understand. I would get it. Got it. This is, dude, this, is Ro- this is Roswell stuff, right? This is, this is man, in, man in black stuff. Uh, Roman tank. Trish, five second answer. You find out legitimately. Seriously, Dave is an extraterrestrial. Your thoughts? <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> You'd wonder if his baptism were valid. Can we baptize extraterrestrials? That's true. Guys, can we stop talking about UFOs and get to that material? <laughs> I'm sorry. Seriously. Come on, Becca is diligently taking notes. The good student over there. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your patience with all this nonsense. In this class. You should okay. ask to see her notes sometime. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> good question. Good idea. The scoreboard rundown. Okay, in the course of this battle, I'm going to start with this. Okay, we're going to talk about the casualties. If it was a soccer game, it goes like this. All right, Germany one nothing, two nothing. There's two one, three two, four two, five two, five three six four six five. Ends basically in a draw. But here's the key point. France will eventually win because of the draw. If Verdun becomes in a, in a certain way, like a second battle of the Marne, explain it to me. I'm going to go through the, the battle in, in, in fair detail. I hope I get, do it justice. But really quickly, what do I mean by that? Okay, over the court, both sides lose a ton of men, right? And the battle, if it was a football game, ends with after two overtime periods, it's still 34 34. No one has won, but really, decidedly, this one side has won. Why? How is it like the first battle of the Marne again, in a certain sense? Verdun and the Somme, make no mistake, are both clear Allied victories. You, you might be wondering, Russian, I know the Allies win the war. It can't just be all America, right? And, and no, we play a mass war, but it's not, you're right, it's not all America. And Groshen, you said up to this point, there's nothing but German victory in the war, minus a couple of hiccups here and there. It's just constant German victory in the East, the West, everywhere. The Battle of the Marne seems to be the only positive thing for the Allies. The, 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 the attack on Paris was halted, but since then, Germany's winning, 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 winning. When are we going to get to some Allied victories? Well, today, Verdun and the Somme, arguably the two most famous battles of the entire war, uh, are both Allied victories. How in a draw, how like the Marne? What do I mean? Is it the same story based on your score? Scorecard, kind of, but. The Germans march in, they're doing really great, but they can't hold it. Kind of, yeah, at this point, sure. Something to do with like where, like, it's like kind of like a standstill of in between like the frontier of France and Germany, like they're both kind of like in between France and Germany. So it's like a locked in, like, okay, yeah. they're not events anymore. Yeah, and see, this is interesting because here's the answer. Both of you are right. The answer is, in a certain sense, the Allies, owing to their numerical superiority and the fact they weren't boxed in as Germany was, they weren't encircled, stalemates, tragically, God rest all their souls, people that died in this attrition, ratcheting up, getting to these massive stalemates of 1.25 million casualties, the Allies could, in a sense, afford to keep tying. Mm -hmm. Anytime they tied, that could be considered a victory because the conventional wisdom, remember what Falkenheim said two lectures ago? Falkenheim, excuse me, is actually relieved. He's relieved because of Verdun. He's relieved in August of 1916. Ludendorff and Hindenburg come and take command. Ludendorff and Hindenburg both say, um, we have to ratchet up the Hindenburg program, war, war total economy. Britain has done its military service act last, last week, last class, but you know, early in the war. We just don't have the men. There's, there's this constant thought on the German side. The only way we win the war is outright victory. We have to, we should, we should have happened at the Battle of the Marne. We should have gone all the way to Paris, the Franco-Prussian War again, they sue for peace. The Germans eventually, and we'll see this later in the class, do win the war in the East, crushing, smashing victory, the Treaty of brest litovsk They get enormous tracts of land of, out of the former Russian Empire, which the Bolsheviks, which are, have already successfully completed their revolution, are more than happy to give. 
because yeah, down with this international war for capitalism, you guys take it, uh, your, 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 your bacon's cooked anyways, your goose is cooked, your, I mean, pretty soon the workers are gonna rise and like Marx, throw off their chains, blah, 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 one world revolution, making all the world red for communism. The Germans do win the, in the East. The thing is, the reason the answer is, so long as the allies hold, they believe it's a very sad calculus because to get to this, you have to constantly expend lives. Hence why the casualties are so high. They believe as long as we hold, we can call up more men. The Germans don't have the men. The Germans are on track and guess who's coming to support us soon. I know the allies are saying, imagine French and British combined headquarters. I know the Americans are out of the war. I know Woodrow Wilson is running on a campaign in 1916 and he kept us out of the war. But everyone knows what happened with Lusitania. And we know that, that the Americans are kind of are helping us, funding the British in some ways. We know the Germans are being demonized in the American press. If you think propaganda and fake news are bad now, it was invented in World War I. Again, part of my chauvinism, considering World War I, like everything's here, but it is. The Committee of Public Information, that doesn't sound creepy at all, right? Um, the Committee of Good Speak, Public Make Good Citizen Information, dot com, is developed in America in this time to create the impression in the American mind that Germany isn't bad, they're evil, and the Allies aren't just the side that we prefer, but they're like the holy side, angel of mods side, God is on our side, providential kind of stuff. So the Allies have this double calculus in the mind is like, we don't like losing men either, but as long as we prevent the one thing ha from happening that can't happen, the Germans just totally crushing us, not just winning, 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 but ending the war because we're, we're, we're just done. And the Americans are like, sorry, we wanted to help you, but you already, the treaty's already signed. As long as that doesn't happen, as long as we hold long enough, the Americans will eventually come in, plus our men, the Germans will run out of men and material resources. And that, that is what happens, right? That is what happens late in the war. Yes, not to jump too far ahead, but in 1918, Blackjack Pershing, the American Expeditionary Force comes in in the 100 days push onto Armistice Day. It is one American victory after another. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Black Day in the history of the, the British Army, which is July 1st. The Black Day in the history of the German Army is August 8th, 1918. And you have, they, they are, at that point in the war, the Germans are being beaten on the battlefield, like one of the first times in the whole war. So the Germans do lose the war in some sense, but please note now, just going ahead to help you as a kind of trailer, spoiler ahead, the Germans' biggest problem is, owing to lack of men, lack of resources being circled, the Germans, more than any other side in this war, have to clearly win. If they just do good and kind of tie, they're most likely going to lose. The only complication to this narrative is if the Americans don't join the war. Like you can rebut me and say, wait a second, but what if the Americans don't come in the war and actually remain neutral? Well, then you're right. The war kind of ends in a tie. The Germans would have won without the Americans because they already won those tracks in the East. And the Germans right could have said, look, French guys in Germany and Britain, the Americans aren't coming. So that was like 80% of your hope and plan. You guys are kind of screwed. There's no support. Let's just end this, please. We might even go full Bethman Hallbeck, remember? We'll give Belgium back because we won so much stuff in the, in, we can't imagine, can't believe the Christmas present we received in the East with all the land we went in Russia. We'll let Belgium go back, not even vassal state. We'll do to France what we did post franco prussian War and let France maintain its autonomy. We're just going to be the big dog and there's not going to be any more questions about who's in charge in Europe. We are more so than we were even in the years leading up to the First World War. So the Americans so, are really complicated, but that's, that's the key. Yeah. So ahead. if Germany had won, do you think Hitler would have come to Absolutely Germany? not. That's, that's what I was thinking. So Absolutely not, by, by his own admission. Mm -hmm. Hitler, God have mercy on him, right? He's one of the most evil men in history, or what he did, certainly. He's horrible. There's no defense of what he did at all, period. But you can say, looking at his character, he was a patriot for Germany. He loved the Kaiser. Yeah, he, he wanted to overthrow Gustav Stressman in the Weimar Republic because he looked at those people as usurpers and that the Kaiser was forced to abdicate. This was so evil and ended the great German Reich and all this kind of stuff, all that kind of stuff. But he was absolutely a patriot and very committed to the Kaiser and that old German empire. No, he doesn't rise at all, period. Absolutely not. So if Germany had won, would it be, have been better for the world? I always, I've said that from the beginning. I okay. wish that would have happened, yeah. I like haven't really listened well enough from the beginning. Well, no, it's fine. But what I, no, no, I'm not saying like, oh, you should, you should know this. I'm not saying that way. I'm saying that, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that. Maybe the worst thing that happened for the war, for the, for the world, is that the Germans didn't win at the first battle of the war. Maybe that would have tamped down all the kind of garbage extremism in the interwar period. Why, why do people like uh, Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin rise? Why does Stalin, if, 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 freak, if the Germans win at the first battle of the Marne, is there a Russian revolution? Probably not. We still have a czar today in Russia, maybe. 
Now, I don't know, right? I don't know. That's a big assumption, but we're already I'm probably maybe not. We probably wouldn't still have serfs or whatever they well, were. Well, serfdom was abolished in 1861, anyways. But I was there in a second. That was a long time. But wasn't there still they didn't have, I thought that people in Russia still didn't have sure some people arose, arose by another name. Yeah, fine. Not, and, 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 you're right. In, in 1905. Uh, Nicholas II is forced to compromise and go from being absolute fiat ruler emperor. Do not lose your train of thought there, please. I see your hand. No, you're good. no I promise I want to come to you in one second. Do not forget what you're going to say. I'm sure it's going to be, well, maybe kind of good. We'll see. Just don't lose your train of thought, anyways. Uh, Tsar Nicholas II is forced to go from fiat rule, whatever I say goes, the way Dave Schmidt operates his life, and just whatever he says happens immediately, to actually having to listen to what the Duma says, which is like the parliament. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that I've said that all along. Maybe that was a great tragedy. We look. Well, what you're leaving. Well, I'll stop. I'll let Claire. And you don't lose train of thought. Claire, go. Okay, my World War history is World War I history is a little. Uh, but um, so if you think about it just purely from a numbers perspective, the Allies would have more just with Russia. But so when exactly does Russia just like fall apart and ask when does the revolution start? Well, we've already talked a little bit about that. And I'm glad you're asking me because you're, you, your attendance in this class is coming at the perfect time for this question. If you're interested in Russia, oh, oh wow. Like we're going to get into Russia big time. The Russian revolution begins in earnest in February of 1917. So still a year ahead. It's maybe three weeks ahead for our class. There's a big revolution. Tsar Nicholas II, interestingly for his history buffs, abdicates on the Ides of March, the day Julius Caesar was assassinated. March 15th of 1917. Over the summer, you have this provisional government run by Alexander Kerensky, who could have been like an American George Washington. It could have been like the transition, not a czar, but kind of a liberal Democrat, the kind of democracy of America. The Great Revolution, the big one happens in October of 1917. That's when the Bolsheviks take over, late in war already. So when does Russia start falling apart? They're already falling apart. Remember the last class, the Bruce Law Offensive? It was the number one most successful offensive of the whole war. Great success. Alexei Bruce, a brilliant general, pushed the line, but we also lose a million men doing it, right? So Russia's been flying apart for a long time. Russia starts flying apart the Battle of Hindenburg in August 1914 when Ludendorff and Hindenburg encircled them, uh, and split Samsonov from um, Renenkampf. Samsonov got a mercy and goes and commits suicide in the, in the forest because he's so distraught having failed the czar. Russia is losing the war from day one, basically. They have some victories on the east, but it's Nicholas II, stupid idea in, in March or May of May, I think, 1915, takes personal command of the army, leaves Rasputin back with Alexander in the capital. Horrible idea. We're going to talk, do a whole lecture just on Rasputin, Russia. So if you're interested in all that, that's coming soon. Um, and in the timeline here, a year, a year from now, <clears> then the troubles really begin in Russia. The thing that the, Ir the Irelanders, <laughs> whatever you call people from Ireland, uh, <laughs> Irish, <laughs> the Irish. There you go. I've never heard that term. Why? Why did I escape? Never heard Irish. You mean like fighting Irish? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Irish heritage. Wow, I'm an idiot. Um, what the what the I Irish? The Irelanders. Why would I say Irelanders instead of Irish? <laughs> Dude, like really? What the Irish failed to do in their Easter Rising in 1916, the kind of French Revolution, the Russians will complete. Okay, it's 904. I want to be done by 940. Just do it like that. It's freaking tight for the class. Like. BMW, best room, the best room on the team. Pistons, V8 engines, like that, super tight, super good. So let's, let's get to that. Okay, uh, so keep in mind throughout this battle, the scorecard, the scoreboard, it goes back and forth, back and forth. What are these scorecards? Well, like, uh, just right away, like, I'm gonna read you the whole battle and I'll go through it point by point. But so right away, um, the, the, the Germans have a successful artillery attack and they captured Fort Dumont. Fort Dumont, I have pictures for you is one of the most, uh, is like the, the prime defense in Verdun. Verdun is this ringed city of forts. Think about like Liège better. Remember the Battle of the Frontiers? They were great forts, but they, didn't, they weren't expecting technology. Same thing, Verdun is this ringed fort city. It's a very old history going back into like um, Charlemagne in the 800s. Verdun is a very classic old uh, medieval France kind of city. Awesome in the med in medieval times. Try sieging that bad boy with arrows. You know, failed, right? But we'll talking about big birthday coming out here and blowing these forts up, okay? Fort Dumont is the main fort. The Germans are going to seize that early in the battle. That's a two nothing at that point. Hmm. All of the kind of ones, one, three, two, four, two, when the French are winning, is that hold. It's not so much the French are winning, they are just not collapsing, crumbling. And again, yeah, sorry, you, you're free to disagree with me. That's a victory for the French. 
The French, the Battle of the Marne plan, just hold, don't let them get to Paris, that is a victory. Um, the real clear victory will come later on for the French around that 6465 period when the Germans start siphoning off people to the Somme and the French too are like, that's where, that, that's the important, the, the kind of the focus of the battle with the British offensive on the Somme is kind of shifting the, the French, the Germans. Um, out in the country in this agricultural area with a bunch of forts, very fortified uh, kind of central place um, for defense, very much like in the Battle of the Frontiers, the Belgian forts were. Think of Fort Dumont as like fort number one, the main kind of fort, okay? And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the French victories kind of come after the battle's already been played out. And you can say even the Germans perhaps have won if we're just doing casualties and scoreboard. But again, they recapture Fort Dumont and then, okay, now it's 6-6, six, six, let's say, equal scoreboard, but they really win because they force the Germans to concede that our plan failed. What was that plan? German strategy, score number one. German strategy due to France would have been done to Russia in the East in 1415. Right, right. This is what Falkenheim writes to the Kaiser in December of 1915. The string in France has reached a breaking point, a mass breakthrough, which in any case beyond our means is unnecessary. Within our reach, there are objectives to the retention of which the French general staff will be compelled to throw in every man they have. If they do so, the forces of France will bleed to death. Does that make sense? So Falkenheim is, I don't have to read the quote again, everyone got it, right? What Falkenheim is saying is like, look how great, and again, right now, Falkenheim is still the guy in charge. He took over for, for Melton Chocolate Milk, von Holtz, guy, my favorite general name guy. He's been in charge of the Western Front the whole time, Eric von Falkenheim. In the east is Ludendorff and Hindenburg, and they've been cleaning house. They've been doing a great job since Tannenberg, Missouri, and Lakes, the Gorlitz and Tarnov offensive, especially all these things we talked about. They're really kicking the, the Russian butt, the collective Russian butt. <laughs> That's the, the, the formal way to say it. That's what historians say. Um, and Falkenheim says, okay, if we're looking for breakthrough victories, we always want breakthroughs. That's ideal. Smash the lines and capture the main objective. Push forward. Capture the capital city if you can. We did this in Belgium. We marched into Brussels and then Antwerp. That's good. That's Kaiser. Man, that's not, as you know, that's not the warfare on the Western Front. It's a static warfare of trench warfare being, of being dug in and just trading blows of artillery and etc. However, we have had breakthroughs. We have reduced the Russian forces and pushed back their lines on the Eastern Front Bruce Wild offensive, uh, no big deal. At this point, he doesn't, it hasn't happened yet. He's writing in December of 1915. The Russians haven't even had their big push. Remember, keep the chronology in your mind. 1916 in the East, the Bruce Wild offensive begins on July 4th. As Verdun is going on, not before Verdun. At this point, there is no Russian pushback, basically. And Falkenheim is saying, we've handled Russia. That's where our breakthrough maybe lies. All we have to do on the West, right? He says, they will be compelled to throw in every man they have. They will bleed to death. We want a battle of attrition. He has two objectives. There's two objectives uh, for, for, for Falkenheim and the Germans. We keep winning in the East. Those are the clear victories. Kind of as well, hold here and just have many, many men die. A lot of our guys die too. But we, uh, as long as the French keep dying, they will have to sue for peace soon. And we're not yet that worried about the Americans because Woodrow Wilson is up for election again. He is the guy who kept us out of the war. And the number one ethnic group in, in, in America, despite all demonization, are Germans. And there are like 83 German language only newspapers in America. Well, we're still not that worried about the Americans yet. Despite the Lusitania has already happened. That's early 1950. That was, oh, oh that, was a bad, that was a bad miscalculation. But we're still not super worried about the Americans. The two objectives, bleed France to death, keep winning on the East. Maybe we wrap this whole thing up soon. That's number three, Falkenheim, two-sided approach, attrition plus forced concentration. Forced concentration means vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the French response. Falkenheim hopes the French will be forced to concentrate around Verdun because of the history too. Verdun has this old medieval history. The French will look at it as a national symbol, a matter of pride. Why is pride, why does pride go before the fall? Why is pride the capital sin? Why in the, in the American South was it seen like the fatal flaw of this idea of honor? Like, I'm gonna go duel you pistols because you said my sister was whatever, fill in your favorite blank, right? You said that you took my sister on a date, so I'm gonna fight you now. Was it worth getting shot over that? That was really stupid, right? I'm about to defend my honor. Like, there's this overinflated sense of honor. Falconheim, I think, correctly has a calculus that Verdun isn't that important. It's not Paris, but the French will look at it as a matter of honor and they will pour in millions of men 
because they can't lose Verdun, we'll kill them all, we'll die too. But because we're winning in the East, they'll bleed to death, we win the war. Does that make sense? That's how Verdun comes about. But 0.2 casualty comparison assumption, the Germans, for one of the first times in the war, really miscalculate. Okay, for one of the first times in the war, the Germans believe they are inflicting losses at a rate of five to two. Okay, so basically that would mean uh, we've suffered uh, 20 casualties, they've suffered 50. Like every engagement, every small engagement, 500 to 200, 5,000 to 2,000. They think it's at a five to two rate. It's not actually that. And in many ways, it's kind of equal. All right. So Falkenheim, when he's eventually removed from command in August, he is kind of dumbfounded the whole way through. He's like, I don't get it. Like, we're, and we're having clean successes. The two main forts that I'll talk about today, Fort Duermont and Fort Vaux. Um, where is Vaux on the board? Uh, right there, 7879, yeah. French defense of Fort Vaux. Really cool story surrounding that thing in a second. But the Falkenheim is like, we're conflicting counties five to two. We're winning in the East. They're gonna bleed to death. We've captured the fort. This is this baby's wrapped up. Let's go, put a bow on it. The war's gonna be over soon. And it's one of the only times in the war the Germans really kind of badly miscalculate. They're not inflicting casualties at such a high rate as they think they are. And that's why they, the, the French are able to hang on. And a lot of those soccer victories and stuff have to, to do with that. Okay, what is some information, position information of Verdun? Okay. So again, Verdun, located on the, Mou on the Meuse River, the Sambra and the Meuse, it's a famous Belgian river as well, you go through France and Belgium. Um, it has a history going back to Charlemagne, again, the treaty of the same name place, the Treaty of Verdun in 843. I didn't say 1843, I said 843, okay? 1,100 years earlier. And this town was a part of the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Empire. In 1648, it was awarded to France in the Peace of Westphalia that ended the famous Thirty Years' War. Verdun, again, right? Pride goeth before the fall. The Germans rightfully believe. And this is actually not far from Strasbourg in that really hot button. I have a map for you, Lady Betsy and everybody. Um, I was about to get my phone from I will, yeah. I'll have a map for you for Verdun in the song. I'll show you where Verdun is and then uh, vis a vis the song as well. Oh, this, this, of course, is all in this area, right? This is all in this area of um, the Western Front frontier. It's the same place between Belgium, near Luxembourg, Eastern France. The Germans think, okay, uh, they will they will um, defend it no matter what to last man. And Falcon's, Falkenheim's dual uh, force uh, concentration and attrition strategy is banking on that. And that'll help us win. It's a simple strategy. It fails, but it's like putting aside the fact of how awful it is that men are dying at a you know, million casualty rate. It's a solid military strategy. It makes sense. If you're playing chess, like we're going to concentrate the, the, the queen and the bishop and the horse here and make these certain moves that we're going to sacrifice pawns you know, early in the game because we think we, we think we have the advantage. If you've read the board, you know, we think we can, um, we have, they, they lost enough important pieces or they, they already lost their rook, they lost two bishops, they lost their queen in a really stupid move. Now it's do you can play attrition, people that play chess, um, you can play attrition chess and, and purposely sacrifice pawns, whatever, to, to have an end game. That's what he's looking at here. He's trying to play attrition chess, but he miscalculates how many people are actually being lost. At the heart of the city is a massive citadel, built already in the 17th century and super old, a double ring of 28 forts are built around Verdun. Okay, 28 forts. A lot of these, like Duermont, sand cushion, thick, steel reinforced concrete tops. Okay, these forts have, have, have a, a big, um, a, a large wall system and, and enabling almost like Romanesque crypt-like passages underneath, under archways, they're 10, 20, 30 feet high. The outer forts have shell-proof turrets, okay? Hundreds of light guns, machine guns, and retractable artillery pieces as well, okay? These, are, these forts are Belgium plus, Belgium better for the technology of the turn of the century. Oh no, same story that happens in the, 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 the story of the frontiers. Before I get into the details, can someone tell me though, what is the, what is the big difference here though? And I'm gonna read you one more thing about the French defense in a second. This seems like the, a repeat of the Battle of Frontiers. Fort Verdun is like the Belgian forts. What's the difference here? Dumont's gonna get blown up pretty good. The Germans are gonna take Dumont immediately, basically, at the start of the war. What's the difference though? What's the big difference between the, what happens here and the frontier? Just one difference, that's it. Most of the forts never get taken. Right, and, and they, just, they don't get overrun. In the same exact story, good fronts, in, good forts in Belgium, good forts at Verdun. Good forts in Liège, good technology, good defenses, good walls. Really, good job, Belgians, good job, French. Both of the forts get blown up by technology. Wow, we can't believe the Germans have this kind of stuff. Wow, 
right? And boom, 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 and it crushes it. The difference is in Belgium that and it has the crinkling effect and actually Germans overrun Belgium and just go on through. That never happens here. That's why it's an eventual French victory is the French hold. They hold, they hold again, they keep holding, they hold. And they lose a bunch of forts, but keep holding. And they eventually retake these forts. Yeah, you know, this great moment of this outpouring of national pride when they lost Duelmont early in the battle, but retake it six months later. Even does it matter that it's kind of a paper victory, paper tiger victory, the Germans are already focused on the song. We took it back, damn it. Like not only did we hold it, we recaptured it. The Belgians would have loved to do that. After their forts were destroyed at the edge, not just to have to hold, but to recapture eventually, right? That's the big difference. Claire, you had a question. Well, it's just like a pure numbers. Like I'm not trying to thing, like the Belgian army versus the French army. Absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah, totally. Like That's the Belgians like a, not a- Brilliant point. The Belgians are fierce fighters. God bless them, not chocolate soldiers. Stereotype flush down the drain, nine flushes until the flush, the flushing mechanism breaks off. Like completely destroy that stupid stereotype. They're just too small. Yeah. Just, yeah. So exactly. Perfect. Right. Okay. Last point on the French defenses. In 1915, a year before this battle, 237 guns. Okay. Ring these forts. All right. And French, the French artillery brings reinforcements to Verdun of about 600 guns. But they're going to be facing double that number in German firepower, 1,200 guns, two thirds of which the German guns. What's two thirds of 1,200? 800, right? 800 are super heavy guns, like big bird of step stuff. Okay, this is insane. Um, and the Germans even bring flamethrowers to the party as well. I mean, this is literally like total war like you've never seen before. Yeah, uh, flamethrower tech. I mean, I don't even, what's worse, being gassed with chlorine or being hit by the flamethrower? I don't know. It's kind of seems like between a rock and a hard place. All right, so the battle begins, number six, artillery German open. The Germans are going to commence this battle. They want to open it on the February, or February 12th, okay, because they want to honor Abraham Lincoln. Um, not at all. It has nothing to do with it. I thought I'd try some humor and we're done. No one thinks it's funny. <laughs> um, snow delays it until February 21st, nine days. Listen what happens when the Germans open up this thing, okay? Remember, they have 800 of these massive heavy guns that we're done. 7.15 in the morning on February 21st, a 10-hour artillery bombardment by 808 guns begins. The Germans fire 1 million shells in 10 hours. Okay, so imagine in one day, imagine you're in defense and we're done. That's it, we're done, class is over. Like that, that's enough of an understanding. This is one day of 302 days of this, okay? This is why, again, this is, this is nothing compares to this, I would even argue in the Second World War. You have stuff like, um, the horrible uh, dropping the atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where I'm not trying to pass judgment whether that was justified or not. That's not for me to say. Um, if I do a class on World War II, II, you can ask my opinion. Obviously, I think it's horrible, period. Even if it was like, if people come down the side that there's military, it's, it's horrible dropping atomic weapons on the civilian population. It's evil, right? Question is, was it necessary or not? It's another class. But that's a one time event, right? This is 10 hours of, um, again, I can't, I don't know how to, like, I don't know how to even, like, Put that into to get your mind around that one million shells in one day that pace is not kept up the whole time it's not this is the, the opening artillery is often the big thing open it up really clear the lines go right this is not but if that was at, at that pace you fire 300 million shells you would fire a third of a billion shells in one area i'm going to show you pictures of what verdun looks like today and you'll see i get what that why it looks like that 100 years later hmm. maybe some of you've seen pictures of verdun you've been there walked the battlefield you understand why it looks the way it does the rumble of these shells could be heard over 100 miles away, right? A good tactic, but awful and terrible. And Germans pause at midday, okay? Just to have happens exactly, to have what happens happen, it does. And Germans are like, the French are like, oh, I guess we can come out of our trench. And they re resume immediately, right? It was just a ruse. They pause to have the French come out and then start bombing them again. You know, just enormous amount of firepower. You said one million shells in one day. One million shells are fired from 800 guns in 10 hours. Yeah, so that what, what does that take? 100,000 shells an hour. Um, keep breaking down, 25,000 shells every 15 minutes. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Every 15 minutes, 25,000 shells. It's impossible to even comprehend. And how many guns were firing these? 800 guns. Well, they pretty fast. Twist as much as, yeah, just boom, 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 like nonstop. Team just rotating, just boom, boom, boom. That's all they're doing. It's, it's opening bombardments. There's no one like 
doing anything else. They're just all on, on board, just reload, reload, boom, 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 boom. And again, the Germans are very, very good at mathematics and the kind of schematic of firing art artillery. In addition to having different reconnaissance techniques and the airplane, they know what they're hitting. They're, it's very successful. It's so successful that on the 25th, three days later, the Germans captured Fort Duermann. Okay. The largest, highest fort of the, uh, of the, of, of the forts, okay, the number one fort. So the Germans have won the Battle of Verdun in four days, it seems like. Okay, they fired a million shells, very effective. They captured the number one fort. Yeah, sorry, if we capture your, does it matter with forts if it's the highest fort? Probably not, right? High ground doesn't matter. I mean, really horribly, purposely sarcastic. Like that's all that matters. Not only is the biggest fort, it's also on top. So it stands to reason if the Germans capture Fort Dumont, they bomb everyone else from Fort Dumont, from the place the French are supposed to be defending. This is a massive French or massive German victory, excuse me, okay? So right away you have in, in the, the bombardment onto this, the same story. Wow, gosh, you tell me a new one, right? The same joke, different day, same joke, different day, same narrative. Germans are really good at war, right? And they win and they, they capture the fort right away. This is why though, again, this will be so important when the French recapture it because it's seen as such a big national symbol. Okay, so pretty, pretty soon though, they capture the fort, but all right, fight, the, the, unlike Belgium, here's the first turn in the war perhaps. Unlike Belgium, but like the Marne, the Germans are like, wow, it was great, but the French aren't going away. Why are they not going away? Like, did, did, they, did they even have a million shell message sent to them? Like, that seemed like that was strong enough to get them to get off this land to let us through, not let us through, but you know, capitulate basically, right? Like the Belgians did. We've pounded them into submission like no one's ever been pounded into submission before. I would stand so the reason. How many people did those million shells kill? I don't know. I don't have the stats on that. Okay. Um, and no, no, no. It's a great question. Um, I have only the, the stats of the entire, the whole thing for you, kind of in summation. But 1.25 million on, on both sides combined die in this battle. But I would even argue, like, of course, one loss, one loss of life is, is precious and sacred and tragedy. But it's not even so much they kill a lot of people, but it's more just like the psychological terror of every 15 minutes, 25,000 shells keep breaking it down. What does that break down in every five minutes? It's a third of 25,000. 8,000 8, shells every five minutes. Just keep breaking it down. What does that come down to? Like 1.3, 1,300 shells every minute? And that's the rate. Yeah, that's the ultimate rate for, for minute. Every minute, every 60 seconds, 1,300 shells. And it doesn't stop for 10 hours, right? But it's more of the kind of like, this is what we have. There's so was each of these guns like two miles or more apart? I'm not sure how far the lines are apart. Um, every you know, hour. I mean, with that, you said, how many guns was it again? It was 808 guns. 800. Oh, never mind. So, so it would be like um, 50 guns per mile or something. Oh, I see what you're saying. Spread out this way yeah. from each other. They, the, the line they bomb, one million shells on a 19 mile front. Yeah, they're, they're fairly spread out. I, I love thinking about Moscow and Pullman and how far away they are. So seven miles. I mean, this is, you know, are, this is, this is a line from Pullman to Troy. Let's say basically, this is a massive line, mm -hmm. right? So they're spread out, you know, out of, you know, how far away they fired from, I'm not sure how far away the actual trench lines are from themselves. A few miles or so. Some of these guns, the, there's a gun called the Paris gun. The Germans use to bomb Paris. They do it from 87 miles away. This is insane. This is like bombing Boise from McCall, basically. This is crazy, right? Ooh, shells are landing in Boise. I wonder if they're coming from Eagle. They're coming from McCall, actually. No way, you're kidding. I mean, so, so these, they have the technology to fire from very, very far away. The lines are close enough. Why? Obviously, because after we do a bunch of damage, we want to be able to take the battlefield with soldiers. You don't bomb from 20 miles away and say, hey, now go on a 20 mile march within a couple of days. So it's, it's within the lines are probably a couple of miles away only, which makes the guns even more devastating. Instead of firing like this, you're firing basically just straight ahead down like a machine gun. You're firing an artillery gun like a machine gun, basically, just immediate impact. It's just absolutely it's horrifying. It really is disgusting. Um, very, very impressive technologically, but just absolutely disgusting. And you see why it's kind of psychological the damage of this war. Let live through that. You live through 10 hours of a million shells. Tell me you don't have PTSD, right? I don't care how brave or tough. You, you, have to, you probably have to be psycho, actually, literally. Have a part of your brain missing that sense of fear or something to actually survive that normally, you know, without every time you go to bed for the rest of your life having a nightmare about that and thinking you're back in there, you know, I can't imagine. can't imagine what that must be like. Uh, okay, the second phase begins. German press ahead, but French stymie. Hold two, right? In March, the Germans continue their their second phase. And a lot of this stuff is going to be taking place at Cote 304. 
okay? Or uh, um, L'homme mort, which means dead man, dead man's hill, okay? There is a hill in the area of Verdun that is being taken back and forth between the Germans and the, and the French, and it's tragically named Dead Man's Hill for obvious reasons, that it just becomes this, all of Verdun, you know, I'm sorry to make it, to oversimplify it, but it just is a massive attrition battle. It's, a, it's maybe the ultimate meat grinder battle. It's the ultimate, okay, so you're telling me in World War I, guys were just kind of sent out purposely to die for attrition. Both sides agree here. Both sides, remember the Chantilly Conference the previous year when the Allies try to get Nicholas to attack and he does in the Lake Narok Offensive. They're just like, just kill more people and we'll die too, but it's fine. Both sides are, are a race to the bottom of humanity. Both sides are saying, we don't care how many guys die. We're confident, both are confident that they'll quit first. So we're done over the, over the, the, the in between in this no man's land of this shelled out moonscape from all the artillery fire, there is nothing but, um, there is nothing but a just constant death and trading of casualties. It, it, that is as simple as you need to, 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 to understand. And the Germans are getting very, very frustrated because as they keep bombing and being successful in certain tactical operations, the French are not giving up, they're not quitting, okay? So in the second phase between March and April, it was two months. The first phase, of course, begins with bombardment, the capture of Fort Duomo, the, 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 the number one French defense. In the second phase, April, um, in March, the Germans, again, do not make the progress they imagine they should be making. This is where Falkenheim's false prediction comes into play. Remember, he thought we were inflicting casualties at a 5 2 rate. Well, it's not really true. It's more even than he thought. And so he'd be more, he'd be more and more surprised at why, you know, what's, uh, what's going on. Okay. The third phase, April 16th to July 1st. Why is it end July 1st? Because that's when troops will be siphoned off towards the Somme towards the second battle we'll talk about, right? So really you can say, please note this, the Germans are all in in Verdun from February to July. The second part, this is where the French victory got that question mark. The Germans are like half paying attention. They've kind of half left. We can insult the French tactics and be like, yes, you guys won because you held on. But when the Germans were all focused on you, they were kind of kicking your butt. When they go and try to deal with the British and the Somme and leave, of course you win. It's like, the Vandals were losing the football game 28 to nothing at halftime. And the game ends up 28 28. Oh, the third and fourth quarter, their team played with four players against your 11. Oh, that's cool. Right? Like, there's, a certain, there's a certain key here of like the, the Germans are distracted in a way. You can say, God bless the British. And all those guys who died in this horrible black day for the, for the British Army on the Somme on July, July 1st. I read you the stats before, but it's the worst day in the entire war, I'd argue. They didn't die in vain, perhaps, because they saved their French brothers, saved the Allied cause by having a have German troops transferred to the Somme, okay? The German infantry in this third phase of Verdun, Verdun 3, by April, Falken, let me read that first, number one, seven, four, by April, Falk doubts, Falkenheim doubts. Yeah, by April already, Falkenheim has been telling people in this third thing that infantry should advance close to the barrage. Yeah, why don't you go first, man, right? You're not just getting blown up enough. You guys go, go closer to their guns. We need more people to die because you'll kill practically. He's going, he's going, he's going all in. Full, you know, pushing all the chips to the table on attrition in April. Falkenheim. He orders the infantry to um, attack. But again, this is incompatible with his misunderstanding of the casualties being inflicted. If it's five to two, it's still terrible because you're sacrificing your men, but maybe he has a point. But if it's even, he's just doing them for, for no reason. And indeed, these changes desired by Falkenheim for the Germans to attack more aggressively in the open field of Verdun have little effect because. Artillery is a neutralizer all around. Despite the million, the million bombs dropped, despite that massive barrage, all that kind of stuff, the Germans have maintained their artillery pieces, the integrity of the artillery fire. And when the, when the, when the Germans come out now and it's open, because fall time, let's go get that breakthrough. Five to two, we have the advantage. Um, those people are mowed down as easily as the Germans have been doing the whole time on the Western Front. Remember that, that sad 8,300 casualties to nothing? That's what's happening to Germans, all right? Artillery is making this battle a complete and utter and total stalemate. And this is bad for the Germans, but acceptable for the French, because the thought is again, like I said earlier, if we just hold on long enough, we allies will have help come soon. We can, we can kind of hold up. Okay. Uh, so the summer of 1960, I mean, the kind of middle months here, May, June, and July, a summer of pure attrition, attack and counterattack around all around Fort Duelmont. In fact, um, the, the, the French now, 
between May 17th and May 21st, un unleash their own kind of version of a million shells, maybe not as much, but they bring up 300 heavy guns and they start bombing Fort Dumont now. Okay, the Germans had seized Fort Dumont earlier, which was supposed to be the main position of the French trying to get it back. And it's not working, they're not recapturing it. But what are they doing the whole time? They're showing they don't, they're not quitting, and they're keep uh, you know, holding on to it the whole time. Okay. Now, perhaps the best example of this French resolve, this French heroism, this French we won't quit stymieing the attacks, is the defense of Fort Vaux, one of these other Fort Dumont-like main forts. All right. The, uh, the Germans eventually will capture this fort, okay? They eventually will capture this fort. But listen to the heroic defense, and it's probably a microcosm of why the French eventually win this war, win by, by be a stalemate draw. After three days of the initial bombardment, which starts around the same time, million shells, between February 21st, 26, okay? The, the Germans have, in, the French in three days have suffered almost 6,000 casualties. Here's the numbers for you guys, it's the numbers. Because the fort is bombarded with, bombarded with all types of guns. The Germans unleash every possible thing they have in Fort Vaux, kill a bunch of people. And yet, and yet, as this bombardment continues through the next three months, the, the French still have Fort Vaux. Uh, the French will not surrender. In fact, this commandant named Reynal, it's his last name, R-A-R-A-Y-N-A-L. He is told to go take command of Fort Vaux. Fort Vaux, it's been bombed for three months, these guns, but still the French are holding on to it. You know they tell him, by the way? Hey, uh, Commandant up Reynal, they have, there's no ammunition there, no artillery. I want you to just go hold this fort by whatever means, with a sword, whatever, right? We have to hold this. I guess the Germans are right. Our pride demands it, but it's more than that. We have to just hold the line. We can't let the Germans through on the way to Paris. We have to. So you have to go there and basically do a suicide mission. So the Germans continue to bomb it. Reynal is holding the fort. In early June, June 1916, the Germans penetrate the fort with flamethrowers. And inside the French have to defend the fort, no artillery, no neutralizing factor, which is the pistols, the guns, whatever, machine guns, the turrets, but they have but swords, kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat, whatever. On June 5th, Reynal says, talk about, again, heroism slash insanity, I want you guys to bomb the fort. French, I want you to bomb our own guys. We're going to defend this last man so much. We're going to try to evacuate the fort while you guys bomb the fort. Just to, we have to hold the Germans no matter what. We're fighting the last man here. The, the, the order is not exactly carried out. No, we're not going to bomb our own fort. Reynolds keeps holding on. He's like, fine, I'm just going to fight her until I die. Including, including in the last three days, this fort holding out Vaux from June 5th to the 8th when there's no water left in the fort. So it was bad enough they had no artillery, no supplies based, and they're being attacked by flame first. not even food or water here. The Germans finally capture it on June 8th, okay? But they give Captain Reynal like a, a sword. <laughs> they give him like a like a, a, a prize. Like, you are so badass. <laughs> like, we, we're glad we captured it. And, th and this is actually, this is a beautiful moment in the war, right? That these people really were, they had some of this kind of like Christian code of being a knight. They're like, you are a badass. Like, one, you're a Chuck Norris level. Like, we thought the fortune had ended. We, we know, we know because of the fighting. We know you had nothing there. And you fought the last week with no water. You're a freaking legend, man. And we have to take you into captivity. But here's a prize. Like, you're, you're awesome. You're a really cool dude. And, uh, it actually is beautiful in a certain way. Like, you know, like we're going to capture you and execute you. No, like, he's actually like a hero. We're like, we have mad respect for you. <laughs> um, Can I? Yeah, but If they have absolutely no weapons. No, they have weapons. They have, like, pistols and swords and stuff. They don't have artillery in the okay. anymore. That's been, like, totally blown out of the water. They they're not no weapons. Okay. They, have, they have no, but, but when you're being bombed by artillery and machine gun fire, not having artillery is like having no weapons. The whole point of a fire is to have can uh, of a fort to have cannons to fire on the infantry trying to get it. If you don't have that, you don't want to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with pistols in closed areas. I'll show you what Vaux looks like in a second. So it's basically having no weapons. They do have like you know they have uh, whatever carbines, machine guns, they have mm -hmm. turrets that haven't been destroyed, but it's pretty um pretty dire circumstances. This really takes us to the end of Verdun because Verdun 4 from July to December 17th, the Germans, <laughs> it's not right to say aren't trying anymore, but basically. The Germans are focused on the Somme. We're going to transition to Somme now because they are like, we're, we, we failed to bleed French white. Dang, if the French are really like Captain Reynolds, 
We never can make jokes about the French flag being a white flag and all these terms. These are brave, really amazing fighters, worthy of Napoleon type humans. And so the Germans kind of like, let's go to the song. The greatest French victories happen when the Germans kind of aren't there anymore. But does it matter? Imagine if you're French. We got took the took a thousand million shells that the Belgians did. They collapsed, no fault of their own. They, they're a smaller army. They had to surrender. We never surrendered. And we captured back Fort Mo. Yeah, heck yeah. Right? They, they, they take back these forts. So we're done. Clear French victory. Despite so much of the German tactical success, it's clear French victory. What happens in the song? Let's talk about the song. Well, the song, okay, uh, July 1st to, to November 18th. I, I'm going to spend like five minutes in July 1st and like three seconds in the rest of it. The song basically is July 1st. July 1st is the black day of the, um, the British ar army. It's the worst day in the history of uh, the whole world war, I would argue, the worst singular day. And I'm not saying this is an Anglophile. You know, English is my native language. We're still all British. We still belong to the British world, right? Us and the British and Australians are all like the Anglo sphere of the world. I'm not saying that as like American pride or whatever. Just in one day, in one attack, 57,000. British soldiers are wounded, 20,000 are killed. Okay, 20,000 people are killed within, a, within a, like a couple hours. And the worst possible thing is, this was an open human wave attack. Remember we talked about that last class, human sea attack, that Hay, who becomes later known as the butcher of the Somme, just is like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Uh, I, I understand, maybe you could say, I understand that people walking across open field getting low by machine fires, bad tactics, let's try it again. And he, people come out of the trenches, walk across open land, just completely mowed down, complete failure. And the problem is the artillery fire that the British had done on the first day fails to cut the barbed wire perfectly, fails to neutralize the defenses. So not only are you guys walking across a couple miles, they have to be funneled in like cattle into like one place that can pass the barbed wire. So now all of a sudden, it's the machine guns firing across a couple miles, there are like nine machine guns on one like spot of 50 yards. I mean, it's like, it's, it's literally shooting fish in a barrel. Okay, this battle was Haig wanted to be called the Great Push Forward. That it's referred to colloquially by British soldiers then and now as the Great F Up. Um, yeah, fair enough. I mean, literally, right? Where just literally twenty thousand British soldiers were sacrificed for what? I argue today that they did not die in vain, perhaps in this Allied grand strategy because they relieved the pressure on Verdun. But it is kind of the Great F Up is certainly fair enough. Haig has two goals. Right, pressure, we're done, pressure relief, relieve the pressure, we're done, okay, maybe that's accomplished. But again, like Falkenheim, attrition and flight casualties. It's a horrible, tell it to the mothers who lost their sons. General, how are you gonna protect my son? Well, ma'am, he's gonna be in the front line, walk across the open field, getting shot by machine guns. He's gonna die for his country, he's a hero. Like, who wants to hear that? Like, his goal is to have people die, but hopefully we kill enough of their guys first. And, and then the head shaking thing, that is the only thing to do. It's like, there is no, that, that is a strategy. And that's a really crappy strategy, right? Yeah, I guess it is a pretty crappy strategy. That's the strategy, though. Mm -hmm. uh, Ulster connection, yeah, 10 4. There's uh, a possibility here, people say. Research in German archives revealed in 2016 that the British offensive had been betrayed by two politically disgruntled soldiers from Ulster beforehand. This is really cool. This is when our class gets the timeline works. The Easter uprising was a month and a half before this, five weeks, April 1916, right? So soldiers who were pissed at the British and when they put down the Irish revolt, archives today, today suggest historians who are always trying to revise the story, that maybe the Germans were even more prepared for the Somme offensive because spies had told them, like, hey, the British are going to go do this, which makes it even more, you know, helps them undergo the preparatory work, the defensives to really do what they do to the British. Thankfully, the casualties will drop pretty quickly, quick decline in casualties. The first day, the first day, 57,000 soldiers die, and yet... In this, in the, the first phase of the Battle of Somme, by the way, if you want to know, not to know this, but it's called the Battle of Albert from July 1st to 13th. The Battle of Albert is the, the technical term for the sub battle of the Somme. Between July 2nd and 13th, the British suffer about 25,000 casualties total, not 57,000 the first day. So the rate of loss between July 1st and 13th in this Battle of Albert changes from 60,000 a day in the first day to 2,000 per day. So it drops by what, three? They're drops by a factor of 30, 30 times, right? What is that? 3,000%, I guess, would be the official thing, right? I mean, just, yeah, so that, that's good. That's a good thing. Maybe it's more than 3,000%, but math might be off on that. But, but you know, it's pretty, pretty quickly changes from that doesn't work, don't do that again, to more kind of tactical battles. 
The next battles, uh, I've prepared Wilderness War, Life Third Ethra, all these supplementary battles. I'm just going to read these. Do not have to write these down, just for your sake. From July 15th to September 3rd, the Battle of Delville Wood, the Battle of Pozier from June to September 16th, the Battle of Guillemont in early September, Battle of Canici, Battle of the Ancre from 13 to 18. These are all sub battles of the song. If you're a super nerd and you want to go read these on your own, that's fine. But basically, and I don't mean to, to, to discount the loss of life at all in these situations. Every, every loss of life is a tragedy. But the psalm really is day one. It's really day one, a horrible, great F up, as these guys say, tactically. Then the British settle in. And here's the key thing. The British clearly win the Battle of the Somme. 1916, you can say, is the year of the Allies. Finally, after all these German victories, especially in the Western Front, finally some good news for the Allies. For Dunn, as we mentioned before, the soccer game breakdown is a great victory for the Allies because they hold on to prevent the capture of Paris et al., et cetera, all that kind of stuff, and hold the line. The Somme is a victory because the, the British, by the end already, by the fall here, these sub-battles are inflicting more damages, more casualties, getting more land on the British, and they are, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sequel to Verdun, a positive sequel to Verdun. At Verdun, the Allies hold at the Somme. The Somme is an offensive now. The, the offensive, you can say, maybe doesn't totally succeed. We're not marching across Belgium into to threatening Berlin. But again, it's under that guise of Allies that they just go punch for punch with the Germans, which at this point they haven't been. At this point, it's been Germans knockout rule, knockout rule. They're almost knockout rule, down to the map. Here it's the Allies punch back in 1916. And the Somme is a clear. Um, victory by the end of the, by the end of the war already by the end of this uh, let me see here um, by this battle of the Ancre A N C R E in November 1916 okay the this is right at the end of the war the Germans capture seven thousand German soldiers that's how the Battle of the Somme ends with the British taking seven thousand prisoners that's very successful it's very good right in a certain sense from a tactical mm -hmm. sense so the Somme and the Verdun big victories. Before I show you the photos, let's look at what are some of the after effects. What are some important things to consider? Well, one, Allied morale. That's big up. Yeah, right? Allied morale raises. German plan. Now the Germans maybe say, I have U-boats in parentheses. Now I have to start doing U-boat stuff, unrestricted submarine warfare, because it's not working anymore. We're not having the knockout blows we want. And finally, full Augusta Levin's gone. My friends, if there's one lesson by 1916, is that war is hell. And war is hell, period. And no one is thinking anymore like, well, maybe it's not that bad. After the Verdun and the Somme, after Verdun and the Somme, it's impossible to speak of World War as anything but a great, grand, massive, horrible tragedy affecting all people um, in an equal sense. Okay, so let's look at the slides I have for you. Um, why can you put me on? Hmm. That is unacceptable to me. Let's see, I'm gonna move the thing, zoom, we'll look at the thing. Second, okay, very good. All right, last five minutes of class. Paris, where it's done, it's located, you see the little red dot, right? So it's not, it's not too far from Paris, right? It's an, it's an important place. It's again in that Alsace-Lorraine area, look where Strasbourg is. Strasbourg is Alsace-Lorraine, revenge is the number one cause why maybe the French want to go to the war and re regain that territory, he lost the German Empire. So that's like 150 miles from Paris. What is the, yeah, I think so, right. If you, yep, looking at the legend on the bottom. Yeah, that's fair enough, I'd say so. That's, that. is that, that's Spain below, I guess. Yeah, the Pyrenees yeah. line, that's Spain, yep. Right. For Duomo, today. Which looks amazingly before being destroyed, like the front Yeah, right, well, look here. Here's what it looks like. Here's a picture of the Fort Duomont before. Okay, yeah, sure. It took us a great comparison. Here after, this isn't that shocking a picture. You can see it's been kind of not reduced. You see the outline, but heavily damaged in a certain sense, right? In these first days of the battle. Fort Vaux is the same thing. Fort Vaux, I have cool inside pictures for you that you didn't want to get caught like these men were in these kind of corridor conditions fighting hand to hand. Remember, this fort runs out of water and supplies, right? I mean, imagine this is a really nice picture. Imagine turning the corner and whatever, firing machine guns in there and stuff, grenades. I, I don't know if they actually had grenades, actually. That could be an anachronism. But uh, that's actually, someone can find that out. Do they have grenades in World War I? Is that a World War II thing? But um, whatever it is, imagine, imagine poison gas being released in one of these halls. 
I mean, where it's like, that's like suicide, right? Everyone's going to suffer that. But these are very kind of, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the, I think the book said that they were down to six soldiers when it got taken it's over. Amazing. Well, yeah. And that it was taken over by chance in that. Um, a, a German guy German gets blown to by accident. Blown, yeah. yeah. Right. He right left his way through and yeah. they, they surrendered. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe that was the greatest thing to happen to those six guys. They survived the war and cut funny story with their German. Mm -hmm. Friend Fritz, who saved their life by taking their prisoner instead of having to fight after that. Uh, this is what these guns look like. CG people here from like Little Bridge. I mean, look at that. That seriously, just that, that thing is scary enough. Just the muzzle on that, the, 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 the firepower coming out of that, especially at a close range. <clears throat> here are now pictures of uh, French soldiers in the kind of no man's land at Verdun. This is an artistic representation of the retaking of Fort Duomont. This is later in, in the Verdun story, right in the fall of 1916. Here are French supplies, supply horses, uh, trying to reinforce French troops at Verdun. But Verdun quickly devolves. I'm gonna show you my favorite picture in a sense, the most haunting picture, I think. There's two ones that are very haunting. But you see the conditions here in these trenches are just like, it's really, I mean, just, just living like rats and animals with actual rats, right? These scenes look like there's some kind of relief at least, right? Somewhere kind of on the outskirts here, but here this guy's, you know, I have another one here, it's even creepier than this, I'll show you in a second. But here people are kind of like, you know, at least above ground, you could say, this one right here, this is a horrible picture. That guy, talk about the absolute, that guy's like he's being tortured. Like, he's like, he's really, it looks like someone like shoved him into this hole, right? That must be horrible on your neck and your back. And above his head, you know, the million artillery shells. This is my favorite photo, the scariest one. Look what has happened to that middle ground at Verdun. It looks like, I mean, every tree, everything has been just blown up and destroyed. As you see from this longer view here, right, later on, um, Whatever once was there, uh, no longer is. World War One is, ecologically speaking, speaking in terms of terrain, deforestation by way of artillery. Like where there was a forest, there's just stumps and trees and like ghostly scenes like that. Like there's been a terrible forest fire. Exactly, the worst fire that burned for, for forever. Here's the creepiest photo, not this one, this is the memorial. This is what we're done, the next photo looks like 105 years later, if you go there today. Wow. The ground has not recovered, probably won't recover ever. That's from the, that, that is not Palouse style natural hilly ground. That's from the shell fire. It used to be flat. And that's what it looks like. That's what a million shells in 10 hours does well, after 300 in two days. And in fact, I, I forgot to mention the casualties of the Psalm. Talk about Verdun. Verdun, 302 days, 1.25 million. The Psalm, 3 million men fight, and a third of them are casualties, a million. Remember, 2.25 million just these two battles. This is the high point or the low point of the war, depending upon how you classify it. Here's how far the Verdun and the Somme are, okay? I don't know if we have a legend on here, but it's enough of a hike in terms of reinforcing people and the Germans leave to reinforce to really, you know, complicate the situation. These photos, like this one, are actual photos from men going over the top on the first day, a couple of these photos, marching across. This, this is probably the most famous photo of this. If you watch documentaries on World War One and the Somme, these are men actually walking out across the barbed wire on this black day of the, um, the British army. 19,000 are killed in a couple hours. Again, again, no man's land. Here is what the Psalm looks like today. Uh, the Psalm, again, this is a great, this looks like Iowa, this photo right here. It's like Crop Circle, Iowa, Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams. A lot of these battlefields are just in the middle of nowhere. There's like farmland, open land. We're going to see that with Third Ypres. We're going to talk about it later on Passion Deal, which is a farm field. But look at as well with the shell fires done. These are all obviously trenches as they look at today. Look at what shell fire has done at the Somme as well as in Verdun. These are not naturally occurring. This is you know, it's dug out by trenches, by artillery fire, and all of that. All right. Um, thank you all for people that listen online. We'll watch this later on. It's always a pleasure to be with you. I will see all of you on next Tuesday. We need a trip to East City Park to the World War I Memorial. We could. We could do